Okay, good morning, church. I hope that you guys are doing well today. It's so good to be here with you. If today's your first day or you're visiting with us, I just want to say thank you for coming Um, to us. It's a, it's a, I don't want to ever just take advantage of or just assume that that you guys would come. I mean, you guys could be doing anything in the world that you would want to do on a Saturday. You could be out riding the Argus in the rain right now, you know, but obviously you guys are smart and you said, no, let's go indoors. But I just want you to know that, that I feel a lot of honor towards you, and I hope that you get something out of today that is going to just help your day be a little bit better, or help your week be better, or just even maybe help a part of your life to be better. So just thank you from the bottom of our heart, from me and, and uh, my wife Casey here, just that you come and, and hang out with us. And then one last thing before we jump into the message today is we do have planned load shedding at 10 o'clock, and so if the power goes out at 10 o'clock... This room is going to go dark. We're going to play a game. We're all going to get up and scream and run, okay? <laughs> so they're going to close all the doors, and the emergency lights are set to not come on. Now everyone to just run around, and we'll see when the lights come back on. We'll see who's left standing, and that person gets a free book from our resource center out here outside. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, No, in all seriousness, we do have a generator, and if the power goes out, just hang with us. We'll lead you. We'll guide you through what's going to happen, but everything will go dark, and then we'll start the generator up, and things will come back on, Uh, so just don't be surprised if you see that. But load shedding is not going to stop us from talking about today what it is that that I want to talk with you about. And I, I want to try and get through this because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through this message a little bit quicker because I want to make sure we get it in before, before 10 o'clock. So I've got, it's 926, so let's see if I can get this done. But my heart feels really, really burdened for what we're talking about today. So I want to make sure that you guys understand the why behind this message. And I want you to understand the why behind reassembly required. So I didn't pick this sermon series because I thought it was a cool graphic. Or I thought that, okay, this at least is is an easy thing for me to talk about for the next four weeks. I didn't pick it for any of those reasons. I picked it because I have a burden for relationships. See, in this room right now, there's a bunch of us, and a bunch of us have broken relationships. We have relationships that have been broken on other people's behalf, and we have relationships broken on our behalf, or we've done something to break a relationship. Now, we're passionate about restoring relationships. It's something that I believe that, that we have to do, and, and I see this as something with absolute urgency. So to me, this is really important that we get this done now, that we get this, we at least give you an opportunity to work on this now. We're not promised tomorrow or the next day. And like we talked about before, it often takes a tragedy. It takes something bad happening for us to wake up and say, oh man, I need to get that relationship right because now all of a sudden I can see kind of that that there's not a great tomorrow left because this person is sick or has been in an accident and I don't want us to wait that long. See, we were made, we were created, we were designed for two relationships. One, a relationship with God. And that I can prove that to you, even if you don't believe in God, even if you don't subscribe to this whole Jesus thing or this whole God thing, there's still something in you that aches and yearns for a greater meaning, for a greater picture. There's something in you that, that aches and, and, and yearns for some kind of greater power, some kind of greater good, whatever it is. Well, the reason that you ache for that, the reason that people create other religions or they put other things in a position of religion over them is because we were made with this innate, unsatisfiable desire for a relationship with God. A relationship with God above. That's why you can't find, it's really hard to find satisfaction when you turn to something else and you put it in that role as lordship over you. We were made to have an intimate, unique relationship with our creator. We were also made to have relationships with each other. In fact, Jesus says, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then go and love your neighbor. So there Jesus is saying, the two greatest relationships you can have are the relationships with me, with God, and then relationships with each other. Now, it's easy for me to stand up here and take the Bible and say, here's everything there is about having a relationship with another or with God. 
It's easy to say, hey, God's chasing you down and he wants to have a relationship with you. And I, I can point you to great verses about that. But it's really hard to talk about why we should have good relationships with each other and why it breaks God's heart, but also why it hinders us when we have unrepaired, unreconciled relationships in our life. See, that, that's a tragedy that I don't want us to live with the rest of our life. So the win for today, the thing that I hope you get out of today, is I hope that you walk away today with something that inspires you or motivates you or encourages you to think, you know what, that broken relationship that I have, I actually can do something about it. And not only can I do something about it, but now I want to do something about it. And in doing this, this is going to be hard. This is, this is a hard one. The last couple of weeks, we've laughed, we've had a good time, we've told stories. This week, this is a harder week. And so we're just going to get, get right to it. I let you guys laugh at the very beginning. No more laughter. This, the whole message is serious. But the, it is serious in a way because repairing something that's broken, getting over a hurt that you've had in your own life, that's hard. It's just plain hard. It's hard to heal. It's hard to accept apologies. It's hard to accept someone else trying to mend a relationship with you. This stuff is just hard. And so we're going to look at it as it is hard. And we're going to talk about the truths about how to deal with this hard thing called broken relationships. But I've got to ask you to do two really hard things up front before we can move on. And these two things that I'm going to explain to you, if you're not able to do them, then that's okay. You may not be ready, and that's okay. And if you're not ready, take notes. If you're not ready, go and find this message online. You know, after the, the service is over, we put it up on YouTube. Go and find it and save it on your computer and look at it when you are ready. But when you are ready, you're going to have to come face to face with a couple things. And the first thing you're going to have to come face to face with is you're going to have to take ownership. Now, I love the idea of ownership. There's a book that I've read. It's called Extreme Ownership. Uh, it's written by an ex-Marine, and it's not a Christian book, but there's so many biblical principles that are in it. But it talks about taking ownership of everything in your life. And if you work on staff here, if you're part of, of our, our, our staff team, you hear me say this over and over and over and over again. So if my staff were to come to me and say, Chris, I've got a complaint because one of my volunteers did not do X, Y, and Z, then they, now they know what I'm going to say. And the first thing I'm going to tell them is, did you equip them? Did you equip them well? Did you explain things to them well? So before, before we place blame on anyone else, the first thing we're going to do as a staff here is take ownership and say, did I set them up right? Did I set them up well? It's this, it's this thing of taking extreme ownership. It's saying, I'm not going to wait on the other person, or I'm not going to put this off on excuses. I'm going to take ownership of this thing. And so when it comes to repairing broken relationships, we have to take ownership of it. We have to take ownership of our part. And taking ownership of our part doesn't mean that we expect the other person to take ownership of their part. We're saying, no, 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 okay, I'm taking ownership. You may not. You may not want to deal with this. You may not accept it. But I'm at least going to take ownership and understand that maybe I did not do something right. And so it's, it's a, a, I've got this statement up here for you. It's reassembly begins with us regardless of who ignited the fuss. So, again, I'll say that because it's got a nice rhyme. Reassembly begins with us regardless of who ignited the fuss. Now, this is taking ownership. This is saying regardless of what it is, regardless of who ignited it, regardless of who started it, I'm going to take ownership of it. It's going to at least begin with, with me. And that's a hard thing to accept because there's something in your human nature that immediately says, no, no that's not fair, that's not right, I, that, I'm not going to do that. They need to take ownership. They need to be the ones to take ownership, and I need to be the one just sitting here on the receiving end. But we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to take ownership of it and just say, you know what, this started with us. I'm going to own it, and now I'm going to work on it. Now, the second thing that I hope that we can all accept is this, is this version of accountability. It's a little bit of accountability. It's why do we do this? Why should we do this? Well, if you don't believe in Jesus, if you're new here, if you're not, not a Christian, that's okay. 
And in fact, you can just sort of check out for the next couple of minutes. But for those that say, hey, I believe in Jesus and I believe in what's in the Bible and I believe in, in the teachings of Jesus, then this is something that you have got to be held accountable for. It's something you've got to hold yourself accountable for. And for those of you that don't believe in Jesus, I want you to learn this is what we as Christians are saying that we hold ourselves accountable for and we hold ourselves accountable to. And it's a verse in Philippians 2.5 and it says this, Paul is talking. Paul's talking to the church of Philippians, and he says, And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, isn't that a wonderful verse? But what happens when we apply the same mindset as Christ Jesus? What happens when I apply it to your life? See, God did not have to reconcile his relationship with you. See, when we were born, we were born into sin. Everyone knows the story of Adam. And then sin separated us from God. And if, if God is this holy and pure thing that can have no relationship or contact with anything else unless it's made holy or sanctified or pure, then therefore when we're born with our sinful nature, we cannot have a relationship with God. We can't have a close relationship with God. And so you know what God could have done is God could have forgiven us. He could have said, okay, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive all of humanity. And he could have left it at that. But that wasn't what he wanted to do. What God wanted to do is he, he wanted to take it a step further. Not only did he want to forgive you, he wanted to reconcile the relationship with you. Which means that God wants to actually bring you in. He wants to restore you into him. Not only forgiveness can happen at a distance. Reconciliation happens close. It's, it's being pulled into relationship with God. And God sent Jesus to do that for us. And so if we're going to have the same mindset as Jesus... We've got to apply that mindset to, to us. You were reconciled to God through Jesus. Now, through Jesus, we can have the same mindset as Christ, and we can go out and take some accountability, and we can reconcile people to Jesus. We can reconcile people to us. We can restore and we can mend our relationships. So basically what I'm saying is it's not okay to remain in broken relationships and to let broken relationships remain. Now I understand there's things that are not in your power and not in your control. This series is not about you being magic or having a magic wand and just making everything better. But what I want to make sure that we do, what I want to make sure that you do is that you know how to make sure that at the end of the day you've done everything that you can do to take away every excuse that there is. And you could say, I have no regrets because I reached and I reached and I reached for this person and I did everything in my power for it. That's, that's what I hope that we take away from this. Now, we're going to look in Romans. So Paul, Paul has these writings to Romans. And we, we think of it as the, the book of Romans in the Bible. But Romans was not, uh, Romans was not written. So that you, you can go back one slide, Karina. Romans was not written so that it could be put in the Bible. Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the people in Rome, and then it happened to be assembled with other books and became what we know of today as the Bible. And so Paul is writing to people in Rome, and these are people that Paul has never, he's never seen and he's never met. These, this is a, a crowd that's new to Paul, and Paul's writing them instructions. He's going to give them specific instructions on how to handle relationships. That's why I had Karina take the slide back, because she was, she was letting you guys get ahead. She was revealing the secrets to you. So we're going to go through what Paul says, and we're going to learn how to deal with our relationships. But Paul's writing to people that he doesn't know. And he's giving them instructions about something extremely important. And that important thing is having healthy relationships with each other. In fact, first he tells them how to have healthy relationships with people in the church. Then he tells them how to have a healthy relationship with people outside of the church. Then he circles back around because he knows that we're a bit dense. And he says, well, here's how to have a healthy relationship with people inside and outside of church. So Paul wanted to make sure that we got it. But here's... Here's another, here's another hard thing. We've had two hard things, ownership and accountability. We're about to have another hard thing. As my dad would say growing up, tough love, tough, tough love. See, Paul is writing to a people that he doesn't know. This is a people being persecuted. This is a people being beaten and punished for being Christ followers. Paul doesn't know them, 
Paul doesn't know their story. Paul is still instructing them on how to live. What that tells me is that the excuses were the life of the Romans. How hard it was, it does not change the truth of the gospel. So what that means for you is that your excuse as to why your relationship is unmended or why your relationships are undealt with or why your relationships are still broken, your excuse actually does not it doesn't hold weight as to what Paul is saying. Paul's not saying have this kind of relationship if it's been broken in this way, this way, and this way. No, Paul is saying, I, I, I know that life is hard, and I know that things have happened to you, and I know that you have a story that I don't understand. I know everyone out there, half of you may be upset right now saying, well, who is this guy? He doesn't know what this person did to me. He doesn't know what I went through. He doesn't know the abuse that I went through. And I, I just want to say up front, I'm not, I'm not saying that anyone needs to be in an abusive relationship or, or put yourself in any danger in any way. Even the Bible talks about ways that you can remove yourself from abusive or dangerous or hurtful relationships, even if they're emotionally abusive. So we're going to set that to the side. And what we're talking about is we're talking about your relationships with people in your family, your relationships where, where pride has gotten in the way or things have become hurt or things are hard or maybe someone's not been nice to you or persecuted you. Paul's saying your excuses don't really matter. I mean, God cares about them. God's heart breaks for what breaks your heart. But it doesn't change the fact that Paul is still saying and that God is still saying to us, this is the way that we need to live our lives. Now, I, that's hard. That's a, that's a hard thing to say, and it's a hard thing to wrap your head around, and a hard thing to understand. But remember, if it were easy to heal relationships, then none of us would have broken relationships. It's not easy. It's hard. It's just a fact. And so rather than running or avoiding the fact that it's hard, we're just going to lean into it. This is hard. And you're going to fail at it, just like I do, over and over and over and over again. But at least we know what to do. At least we understand that God has given us a way. And so let's get into the, let's get into the scripture here. Let's get encouraged by what Paul says. So the first verse here says, says this in Romans 12, 9 through 10. We're on verse 9. And it says that love must be sincere. Now I find it interesting that Paul starts with the word love. So right out of the gate... If we imagine in our head these relationships with Christians, with non-Christians, with people in work, people in our family, people at home, people in church, you know, our best friends growing up, friends that we're in high school or university with, or colleagues at work. If we, if we think about the relationships that need to be reassembled or restored or reconciled or where there needs to be healing, you know, done or there needs to be healing happen. I mean, think about all whatever that relationship is, kind of hold it in your mind. And then the first thing that Paul comes out of the gate with is the word love. He doesn't spare anything. He starts immediately with love. Why does he start with love? Well, because love is what started Jesus' relationship with us. Love is what started Jesus' pursuit over us. Love is what started God's continual pursuit over us after Adam and Eve you know, sinned and were thrown out of the garden. Love is the beginning of all things. Love is the source of God. Love is, God's love is the source of healing. It's God's love that is everything that we need. That's why when Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment, Jesus says the first thing he says is love God. And here Paul says... Love must be sincere. That means you can't fake it. It means you can't uh, pretend. It's, it means it's got to be sincere. It means it, it, you've got to mean it. It's got to mean something to you. You know, we have, have Benjamin. He's a 3 major right now. And we all need to pray over Trudy and family ministries as she has Benjamin. If you guys see Casey run out of the service, it's because Trudy said, I'm done with this. I can't handle Benjamin. But when he acts out, he's learning to act out. He's learning to scream and to throw fits and, and to do stuff. Uh, l last night, Casey said, because he had a car that fell out of the shower, she was worried the neighbors were going to call the police on us because Benjamin was having a meltdown, and it sounded like he was being abused. But that's, that's a child that, that does not quite know how to... How to, how to handle their emotions and how to handle them themselves. 
And so we, we've got to learn how to be sincere about our love. We've got to learn how to apply sincere love to a situation. So with Benjamin, we'll make him say, if he does something, we'll make him say sorry. And he, he already, he knows how to say sorry without being sincere. He knows that if I say sorry, it just moves this process along. It doesn't actually mean that I have to accept or own up to anything. It just moves it along so that I can get to the next thing that I want to get to. And so not only do we teach Benjamin how to say sorry, we teach Benjamin how to be sincere, how to really mean it. And so in context of this verse here, I've got a goal for you guys. There's going to be a goal for all of these. Here's what we're going to aim for. Your goal, they're going to pop it up for you. The goal is for us to get to a place where we see others the way the Heavenly Father sees them. What that means is in order for us to be sincere about our love for others, the only thing that we can try and do is see them the way that God sees them. Because God sees them through the eyes of love. Therefore, the only way that we can be sincere about loving them is if we look at them through God's eyes. So when you look at someone else and you cannot be sincere about loving them, that's okay. It just means that you need to look through a different lens. And we're going to learn to do that at the end of the service. But that's what Paul means when he says that we've got to be sincere. And so now if we continue, we continue in verse 9. The next thing that Paul tells people is that you have to hate what is evil and you have to cling to what is good. What's Paul talking about here? What Paul's talking about is we've got to define the what. Hate what is evil. What is the what? Cling to what is good. What is the what that we're clinging to? See, we often try and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to be mad at this person because they did something to me or they hurt me. Whatever they've done, it made me feel hurt, it made me feel uncomfortable, it made me feel unsafe, and now I'm mad at them. I hate them. I don't like them. Well, the challenge that we have to think about is, is it them or is it the situation? Is it the sin? Is it... It, do you really hate that person, or is it because that person grew up in a broken home, or they grew up with a broken family, that now they only know how to, how to enact or how to operate in one way, and the way that they know how to live is now hurting you? And so should you hate them, or should you maybe instead hate the thing that's not good in them, hate the sin, or hate the fact that they grew up in a broken home, or hate the fact that they're insecure, or hate the fact that they hate themselves? And instead, try and love them. So what Paul is doing here is he's saying, make sure that the thing that you hate is actually not them, but is actually the evil thing. Make sure the thing that you hate when you talk about people, and when you have a burden for somebody, is not, not the things that they're doing or the way that they're impacting you, but maybe it's the thing that's at the root of their heart that's causing them to act the way that they act. Paul wants to make sure that we really know and define, if we're going to decide to hate something, the only thing that we're allowed to hate, the only thing that we can hate is, is the sin that's in them or the brokenness or the hardships that they've gone through or they've endured. And then he says, cling to what is good. You know what? I'm so thankful that people, that, that actually specifically that I have a wife that clings to what is good in me because she's had ample opportunity to not do that. But because I have a wife that says, no, I'm going to cling to the good in you. I'm always going to see the good in you. I'm always going to choose the good in you. I'm going to cling to what God has put in you that is good. Doesn't that make us feel good when we know that we've got somebody that will cling and fight for what is good in us instead of just going straight to hate? See, our goal from this verse here is for you to understand the difference between hating a person and hating a something. There's a big difference there. We need to stop hating people. We need to start clinging to the good in everyone. There's too much going on in the world today. We need to cling to the good in everyone. So let's move forward here. The next verse that Paul goes into is verse 10, and he says this. He says, be devoted to one another in love. There's that love word again. Honor one another above yourself. Honor. Honor is a huge value of mine. It's something that that we teach here. It's something that we really believe in. In fact, I start the service, I start the service humbled. When I stand on stage, whether there's 200 people in here or whether there were three people in here, the fact that three people chose to take time out of their day and come here 
into South Point Church, it's humbling to me. And it's humbling because I'm completely honored by the fact that you took the time to do that. Honor also means that we defer ourselves. It means we put others in front of us. It means that we let go of our pride. We let go of our agenda. See, Paul is saying, be devoted to one another in love. That's like saying, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm devoted to you. Because of this love that Jesus has called me to, I refuse to give up on you or give up on this relationship. And in fact, I'm going to then honor you, which means I'm going to put myself to the side. And I'm going to drop my pride and I'm going to put you first. I'm going to put this relationship and this thing first. And our goal when it comes to this verse, when it comes to honor, our goal is this. It's to say, I'm not going to spend my time trying to convince you. Instead, I'm going to spend my time trying to understand you. Boy, wouldn't that change the entire dynamic of half of our relationships. Would that not change more than probably half of our marriages? Is if we stop saying, I'm going to, you need to understand my side of the argument. You need to understand the point that I'm trying to make. And instead we said, you know what? Instead of spending all this time, this strength, this energy trying to convince you that my way is right and your way is wrong. Instead, I'm going to spend my time trying to understand you. You can't do that unless you honor someone. You can't do that unless you defer, unless you put yourself second and you bring them above you. Now that, this is a hard thing to do. All these are hard to do. But these all lead us to an extremely beautiful place. Verse 14, we're going to move through this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is probably the most, the absolute most personal of all of them. And I wish that I had more time to talk about it. But, but I, I don't have time to unpack it the way that I would want to. But persecution, bless those who persecute you. We've all been targeted at work. We've all been targeted by friends. We've been targeted by families. We've had smear campaigns run on, on, on social media. You know, if you're, if you're an older generation, then man, we are so lucky. I view my generation even as being so lucky that my entire life is not made or broken on social media. But the younger generation, the guys that are in high school now, one bad thing that they do or one thing that someone says and all of a sudden that's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram and their whole life is just smeared. Their whole life is changed. You know, growing up, if we went out and we made a bad decision on a Friday or a Saturday, then that just meant that maybe Monday or Tuesday we were in trouble or it, it would impact our week. It, d- it did not impact our life. Now when kids go out, when high school kids and younger, when they go out with their friends and they go out with each other, One wrong thing, one mistake, one dumb thing that they do can actually impact their entire life. We're we're watching, maybe you've got kids that are dealing with this at school. Bullying is such a big deal. It's such a big issue. It's so hard to then take those people that persecute you, that drive those social media campaigns against you. It's so hard to take those people that have, have... turned all your co-workers against you. It's hard to take those people that have split your friend group in half or split your family in half and have turned those people against you. It's, it's so hard to take those people and say, I'm going to bless them. And Paul circles back. He, not only does it say, bless those who persecute you, he says, bless, not curse. Just in case you misheard me, no, I did not say curse those who persecute you. I said, bless those who persecute you. Paul wanted to make sure that we got this right because he knew that this is one of the, it's so intimately painful. It's so intimately hurtful when somebody maybe that was close to you, you know, stabbed you in the back or or they turned on you or they manipulated something to hurt you. This is such a painful thing to do. And yet Paul is saying, hey, bless them. And remember, you're going to bless them, not curse them. Now, our goal that we take away from this is our goal is to live out Philippians 2 5 which is where we have the same mind as Christ and give up our entitlement to talk about them the way that they talk about us see we don't get to be the ones to make the decision of what they deserve that's why Paul says bless them don't curse them because as soon as we turn around and we talk about them we're making the decision We're now making the decision to say, they deserve to be cursed. They deserve what they're going to get. They deserve to have what's coming to them, come to them. But Paul is saying, no, no, no. 
you need to give that right up. We're going to give up our entitlement to talk about them the way that they talk about us. And something beautiful happens when we work through this really hard thing where we bless someone that persecutes us. And it's, it's this statement here. When we bless those that cause us, that curse us, we are a living, breathing, walking expression of what Christ did for us. See, guys, th- this whole thing is about something bigger than just you and me. This whole thing is about a movement that changes and impacts the whole world. This whole thing is about something that is just so, that, that God wants, that God knows that there can be something so beautifully done. You know, why do we have so much brokenness in the world? Maybe it's because there's so many broken relationships. And it's really hard to deal with those broken relationships. But because God did this for us, because God sent Jesus and he blessed us, even though we put him, our sin put him on the cross, then God is saying, go and do that for the next person. And we'll quickly go through the last couple verses. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. To, to me, this means that we're walking in step with others. You know, we sometimes rejoice when others mourn and we mourn when others rejoice, right? When someone else gets the raise, you mourn. Or when, when someone else gets what's coming to them, you know, especially when something bad happens, you're like, yes, I feel so good. I feel so validated. You know, I, I, I've got so many stories where I've done that the wrong way. And praise the Lord, I don't have time to tell you about them. I've got to move on, but, but, they, but they are there. But guys, let's stop rejoicing when other people are hurting. Let's stop mourning because other people have something good going on in their life. And in fact, our, our goal for this is this. It's, our goal is to accept that when we internally celebrate someone's failure or loss, then we have work to do in ourselves. Now, verse 16, we've got two more and then we'll wrap up. We're going to live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Now, our goal with this verse is is this. Our goal is to accept that pride is the wrong fuel and it will get you the wrong outcome. Guys, pride tears everything down. Pride destroys everything. You know what pride is? You know how to know that you have pride. It's not necessarily thinking that you're amazing. How you know that you are a prideful person is because when you get tempted to do the right thing or tempted to put somebody before you or tempted to say I'm sorry or tempted to apologize or whatever it is, there's something in you that says, nope, not going to happen. And it's like a feeling. It's like in you. That's your pride. And what Paul is saying is let go of your pride because pride is the wrong fuel and it gives you the wrong outcome. Now, the last verse, verse 17, is do not repay anyone evil for evil. Now, our goal here is this. Our goal is that we have to accept that we are not here to bring justice and to be the judge. That's a hard thing to accept because we want to be the judge and we want to be the ones that bring justice. And the reason that's hard is because guess what? This is our last point, is that our human nature is that we want to get back at those people that hurt us. Your nature, your very nature is, I want to get back at them. They deserve it. They hurt me. I want to get back at them for that. I'm not going to forgive them. I'm not going to drop my pride because look at what they did. Look at what they did to me. I'm going to get back at them. But that's not what God's called us to do. Instead, what God is asking us to do and what what Paul is teaching us about It's it's human nature to get back at God, but it's the will of God to get back to. So what God is saying is go back to that relationship. Go back to that person. Go back to that hurt person. Go back. Don't get back at. Go back to. Because see, God's forgiveness is something that, that when God forgave us, it didn't stop at forgiveness. God did not stop with forgiveness. God instead continued to restore that relationship with us. He continued to reconcile. And in fact, God's forgiveness was a means to an end. And then reconciliation was the end. Now, just for the sake of time and and for the sake of of the impending load shedding, I want to, I'm not going to have time to unpack everything that I want to unpack for you. So I just want to get to something um, that I just feel is so important. And it's so important that I teach you how to do and that we learn how to do this. And it's this, how do we know 
when we're doing this relationship thing right? How do we know when we're actually dropping our pride, we're reconciling relationships? How do we know when we're putting God first? How do we know when we're doing all the stuff that, that Paul is teaching us? How do we know that we're doing that right? We'll, we'll, we'll know that we're doing it right when we can do this right here. When we feel towards them the way our Heavenly Father feels towards them, then it's easier to move towards them. When we feel towards them the way our Heavenly Father feels towards them, then it's easier for us to move towards them. See, that, that's how we know that we're getting it right. And so now the last thing that I want to do is I want to lead you guys in a prayer. And th this prayer is a prayer that I believe can change your relationships and it can change your, it can, it can change your life. Because it's so hard to drop our pride and to drop all of, all of this stuff that's hurt us. It's so hard for us to do that. It's so hard to let go of people that persecute us. Everything we've talked about today is hard. I understand that. I recognize that. It's all hard. But a simple prayer, because of the power that is in the name of Jesus, can actually change our life. And I've prayed this prayer with people. I've inserted people's names in these blanks. And when I've inserted people's names in those blanks, I've seen things happen in our relationships that I never would have thought would have happened. And so this is what we're going to do. So I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes. And I, I'm going to ask.